All right, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. And welcome to our, the second webcast in our Modern Mainframe DevOps series. Um, today's session will focus on modernizing mainframe SCM. For those of you who may not know me, my name is Len Thompson, and I'm Broadcom's Mainframe Division Community Manager. And again, I'd like to welcome you to today's webcast. Before I hand you off to Vaughn and Mike, just want to let you know that we are recording today's session, um, which is why you're all currently on mute. If you have any questions along the way, please use the questions box along the right side of your screen and uh, we will answer as many as, as we can during our time together today. And if there are any that we can't get to, um, I'll make sure we follow up after the fact. Um, and also, if we do have time at the end, I will also let you know how you can have your line unmuted if you prefer to ask your question that way. The recording of today's session will be posted out in the CA Mainframe DevOps community either later today or first thing tomorrow. So if you have any colleagues you'd like to share it with, um, that's probably the best way to do that. And also for today's session, we're recommending that you go full screen on the webcast so you can see some of the details when Mike is doing his demo. The last thing for me is that we are always trying to make sure that these webcasts are valuable for you. Um, with that in mind, we have a survey that will pop up at the end of the webcast. I'd really appreciate you taking a minute or two just to give us some feedback so we can make sure that um, our next session is even better. And with that out of the way, I'm gonna hand you off to Vaughn Marshall from our product management team. So take it away, Vaughn. Thanks, Len. All right, welcome everyone. So as uh, Len mentioned, today what we want to talk about is how we can uh, modernize uh, you know, mainframe SCM access. Uh, we have a number of different methods that we're going to go through. So uh, there you can see that there's lots of different options these days for working with the mainframe in terms of version control and software configuration management. So our agenda is going to start with an introduction, just talk about why this is a, a hot topic these days, and then look at some of the challenges that people encounter when they try to uh, approach the, 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 the topic of uh, modern mainframe SCM access. And then we're going to look at a number of different approaches that uh, that you could possibly take. The first one will be a simple off-host interaction with mainframe SCMs. And what I mean by that is essentially being able to work with your mainframe code assets without necessarily going onto the mainframe and, and accessing it via green screen. Uh, the, next, uh, the next approach that we're gonna show is how you can add Git to that to uh, manage concurrent development and take advantage of some of the, um, the, uh, the automated merge capabilities that you get with, uh, with Git that developers know and love. And then lastly, we're going to show an approach that involves a full-blown integration. Uh, now, this one is specific to Endeavor SCM, and essentially it allows uh, Endeavor SCM to be bridged with an enterprise Git repository, such as Bitbucket or uh, GitHub. And, uh, and, and essentially give you that, that tier one fully integrated uh, modern developer experience with uh, Endeavor SCM on the back end. And then lastly, we'll wrap up. Okay, so first a little bit about why modern, uh, modern access to the mainframe matters. So essentially, uh, in today's uh, world, you know, developer, developers are, are practicing agile and DevOps in the uh, mobile cloud and distributed space. They've been doing that for a while now. And uh, when we first started, uh, you know, adopting these practices, uh, when they were new, a lot of organizations kind of thought, you know, we'll experiment with these. We'll see if these things are, are good or a good fit for our organization. And of course, uh, because it's something that's a bit of an unknown, we're going to stay away from the mainframe. The mainframe being something that has established practices, something where you know, you're working with your system of records, so mistakes can be very risky and costly. And essentially, mainframe was left out of the party for many, many years as organizations adopted Agile. So you know, along the lines, we've come to the point that Agile and DevOps practices are almost de facto standards at organizations. Uh, they're really realizing a lot of good success with them. And uh, as such, they're looking at bringing mainframe into the fold. Uh, another, another thing that's shifting is that in the past, mainframe has been seen as something that's gonna be going away. But uh, you know, what we're realizing is that really mainframe is here to stay. And in fact, it's growing. And so as we do that, we're bringing new blood onto the platform. And of course the new blood, they don't mind using the platform. It is an excellent workload uh, you know, processing platform, but they really don't like that, the way that they interact with it. That being you know, traditionally green screen and so on. What they wanna use is the tools that they know and love and have uh, used for years right? In, 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 their, in their distributed space. Things like Jenkins, things like Git, you can see on the left a whole bunch of different um, tool sets. And that's basically the things that the next generation of developers wanna be able to use in their day-to-day -day, day -day activity. So suddenly, um, you know, 
ex taking taking mainframe and bringing it into that fold is a very hot topic. I'd say in the last couple of years, uh, everybody's been asking how can we you know modernize mainframe and fit it into the world of DevOps, fit it, fit it into the world of uh, modern tools, and so on. So that's uh, that's where we are today. Now, uh, essentially. We're going to be focusing in on one uh, slice of DevOps, so mostly the developer role. Uh, it is a core piece of DevOps, essentially. You know, the the, the way in which um, developers interact with their SCM drives the way that they they can uh, you know act in an agile manner. You know, improve their velocity, work isolated, work on branches, and so on. Uh, so that's what we're going to look at today. But this is actually part of a much bigger picture, and I would encourage you to attend the um, rest of our series. You, that we'll be talking on different aspects, different tool sets. But today's today's slice of the series is focused entirely on the um, interaction of developers with the SCM tool. And at the bottom, you can see that there is a uh, little a little graphic of somebody named Michelle. So at uh, Broadcom. We use personas to represent the people that we are, uh, you know, working with uh, that 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 we're developing our solutions for. And Michelle is essentially a mainframe application developer that is coming uh, onto the platform. This is not your um, your your seasoned mainframer, but rather somebody that's new that works on mainframe code, but really wants to be able to use modern tool sets. So that's who we're talking about today. We're talking about you know, not those developers that have used 3270 screens for years and years and years and are quite productive on it, but rather, you know, those that next generation of developers that wants to be able to use the tools in a, in a modern way. Okay. All right. So some of the challenges around using traditional mainframe SEM. So uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, a lot of uh, people have had SEM tools on the mainframe for many, many, many years. Uh, but the interface to them is essentially limited to 3270 or green, uh, the green screen. And of course, the next generation of developers doesn't want to use that. They don't mind using different languages. Maybe they want to use legacy languages like COBOL, uh, et cetera. You know, developers learn, learn new languages every day, but they really don't want to be stuck using uh, green screens. On top of that, you've got the enterprise which is already, as I mentioned, been you know, adopting Agile and DevOps practices. They have a set of tools that, the, the, that they, they are co you know, coalescing around. Typically, those are things like Jenkins or Git. And of course, they want to be able to use those same tools. right? They want to be able to use that to have process consistency, uh, be able to use the same integrations that they have. They want to have the same developer experience from mobile all the way through to mainframe. And so there's that pressure for, for, for them to be able to want to use those same tools in the world of mainframe. And of course, we've got a whole world of new tools coming online every day. So we've got new IDEs. Um, one thing that's becoming really popular these days is lightweight uh, IDEs like Visual Studio Code with lots of plugins supported by the community. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, tool usage is very personal. So lots of developers want to be able to use whatever tools they want. But if you look at the market for mainframe right now, it's still pretty much limited to Eclipse. So Eclipse-based IDEs and so on. Another challenge that we have is the limited support out there for branching and merging. So we've got developers who, uh, who, who want to be able to use DevOps processes. One of the key facets of that is being able to work isolated from other developers, so on a feature branch. And essentially, um, if, you, if you look at the world of mainframe SCMs, that, that feature branch capability is not something that was designed in from, from the get-go. So typically, you know, you have people working um, with the, with essentially uh, one you know one person working on a on a piece of code at a time, and that's untenable. If you need to be able to go fast, you need to have be a, people working concurrently. You need to be able to promote without dependencies and so on. Okay, so let's look at some of the um, stats out there. So this is actually um, some some. Uh, stats from a um, recent poll on um, uh, out on Stack Overflow showing uh, you know what type of version control, what kind of development environments there are. If you look on the left version control, you'll see that almost 90% of organizations are using Git. So the world seems to be standardizing around Git and there's good reasons for that. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. And you, if you look on the right, you'll also notice that the world of IDEs is changing quite a bit. 
And if you look down at the bottom, you'll see Eclipse, which is, again, where we are with the mainframe uh, IDs this day, these days. Uh, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth, right? It's actually not a very popular IDE. Compare that with Visual Studio Code, which is that you know new lightweight IDE, and you'll see that there's a lot of different um, there's a, there's a lot of different choice going on, and a lot of people wanting to be able to use new tools uh, with the languages that they use. So how do we transform? So essentially, if 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 we look at this and we look at the problem, you know, one of the things that maybe maybe you know people start to think is that hey, we can just throw away what we have and start over, right? If I want to do, uh, you know, modern modern development and, and interact with my SCM in a modern way, can I just get rid of all the tools that I've been using for years and start over? Well, you know, that's easier said than done. You essentially have a whole lot of cost, a whole lot of risk, and a whole lot of time to do that. So the other the other problem with that is that you know you have the seasoned mainframers, right? The people who do like using 3270. How do they stay productive with the tools of choice that they're using for years, right? They they may not want to be able to they the, the new developers may want to be able to use the new IDs, but the um, seasoned developers may want to be able to stay in the environment they've stayed in for years. And then lastly, we've got automation that's been in place for many 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 years. The organizations have have essentially been, you know, building up all of their lifecycle automation, all of their builds, all of their processes around their mainframe ACMs, and do they have to throw those all away? So what we're saying is a better approach to transformation might be to layer on new interfaces. Organizations can standardize without having to throw everything away. Right? Instead of taking your old to tools, throwing them away, you can put new interfaces onto the old tools, and then you can standardize. You have no niche tools for mainframe, right? So you don't have to throw uh, you know, a new tool on that might be sexier. Instead, you've got standards that incorporate things that people want to use, things like Git, things like Jenkins. And of course, there's no conversion. Okay, so what we're gonna look at is a couple of different options today. One of them is going to be a full-blown integration into Endeavor SCM from an enterprise Git repository like GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. All of those can be um, used as well. And then we also are gonna look at um, access to mainframe SCMs through things like Brightside, which is, uh, which is based on Zoe. So with something like Brightside, you can use your, your, your simple command line interface to access the mainframe SCM through things like data sets, if there's just code living in data sets, or you can use them through batch interfaces. Now a little bit about Brightside. Brightside is actually something that we developed and which we um, actually built because our own developers wanted to be able to interact with the mainframe without having to go on the mainframe. So they've actually built themselves a little command line interface. We looked at that and we saw that that would be something that the developers that might, might be useful at other companies. And so we actually took that and we used it as a contribution to Zoe, which is a, um, is a, is a uh, consortium of uh, the first open source mainframe project for the Z system. Sorry, I went, my slide went ahead there. So in any case, uh, Zoe is actually an open source project, which is uh, partnered through Rocket IBM and Broadcom, and the idea is that with it you can, you know, essentially modernize the way that you're accessing the mainframe. And of course, it actually won an award. It was voted the most innovative DevOps solution for the mainframe in 2018. And of course, uh, that's that that was pretty impressive because it included not just mainframe but also 
um, all, all of uh, DevOps tools, including distributed mobile and cloud. All right, so let's go ahead and have a quick demonstration. I'm gonna pass this over to Mike. Mike's gonna show us uh, you know, the first approach of interacting with mainframe SCMs. All right, thank you, Vaughn. Um, before I get started, just a little bit about uh, myself. I'm a senior product owner here at Broadcom. I'm responsible for the CA Brightside command line interface, uh, which as Vaughn mentioned, was recognized as the most innovative DevOps solution of the year for, for 2018. I'm also the Zoe CLI squad lead. Um, so I'm responsible for uh, the Zoe CLI uh, associated plugins, as well as the uh, Zoe VS Code extension, which we'll be showing um, on this webinar. So in this uh, first approach, I want to talk about off-host interaction with mainframe SCMs. Um, if we want to go to the next slide here, Vaughn. Okay, um, so accessing source on the mainframe. For the sake of this demonstration, let's consider our source lives in, in possibly one of three uh, different places. So first, consider your source is just in a mainframe partition data set. Um, just a data set on the mainframe. Um, the, the second scenario is your source lives in CA Endeavor. And then finally, uh, your source lives in uh, CA Librarian or um, any um, mainframe SCM that has um, a batch interface. So for the Zoe Visual Studio Code extension, um, we will show, showcase how we can uh, access data sets easily. Um, same with the command line interface. Then with the Endeavor, um, we will use the uh, CA Endeavor plugin for uh, Zoe CLI. And then uh, finally, we will use the uh, jobs and files capabilities of the core CLI to show how you can use CA Brightside uh, to enable modern source access, um, again, for any mainframe SCM that at least has a, a batch interface. Um, so with that, um, Vaughn, if you want to transition control of the screen, then I'll start the demo. All right, and let me you, share you my screen. Yep. Okay, great. Can you see my screen? Okay. All right, so uh, first, let's talk about accessing source in data sets on the mainframe. So first, I want to show accessing that using the Zoe VS Code extension. Um, so I'm just in um, my Visual Studio Code editor. It's a lightweight text editor that, as Vaughn mentioned, is very popular today. Um, if I look at some of the extensions I have here, um, I do have the Zoe VS Code um, extension. Um, and this is available today. You can just search extensions in the marketplace and and download it and install it and use it today. Um, if I go back to my files explore, uh, what this extension did was it uh, added this data sets tree. Here I can search for a particular data set. So um, let's, I have one that I want to access. So if I go to bright.marbles, uh, asterisk, um, this will pull back uh, a list of the, the data sets that match that um, that filter. Um, so here I have a bright.marbles.cobol PDS, and that stores my source. Um, so for example, if I wanted to, and again, I can get um, easy syntax highlighting in this text editor. I just select change plain text to COBOL here. Um, because these don't have extensions associated with them, it wasn't able to dynamically uh, determine this was, was, was COBOL, but I'll show it in other implementations during this demonstration to make that happen seamlessly for you. Um, so here we say the user invokes this transaction, and this is just a, a COBOL program. Um, I'll change this guy to VS Code user, VS Code user. And I could save him, but I want to talk a little bit about how, um, you know, we, we kind of deal with two personas in our presentation. One is Michelle, who's typically working in one of these modern environments like uh, Visual Studio Code. And the other is our Rob, persona who would be uh, working on the green screen. Uh, so say Rob wants to make a change to the same file, uh, he could do so and he would come down to 21 um, and he wants to make an adjustment. He will say um, oops, mainframe user 
and he will back out of here. So that's been saved. Now Michelle, she is making a um, similar change in VS Code, right? And I haven't pulled, but I can do this uh, safe save option, safe save merge if necessary. So when I do that, I'll get a notification that says failed to save. The content on disk is newer. Please compare with your version of the one on disk. I can click compare and I get this uh, merging screen where I can either accept um, my incoming change and overwrite the contents on disk or revert to the previous change. So I'm going to use my changes and it says that the data set's been uploaded successfully. So now if Rob viewed his data set here, he would see that it's been updated to VS Code user. So um, that's access to data sets using the Zoe VS Code extension. Now I can also use the Zoe CLI to pull this, uh, these data sets locally. So it's as easy as a simple command, um, write, files, download, all members of a PDF, and I will do, what was that guy, bright dot marbles dot cobol and I will put the extension of dot cobol on these and he will go and then download all these members that were in that PDF uh, fairly quickly and I can see here if I go down to 21 um, again he'll say VS code uh, user I can easily look at other data sets as well and since I have this dot cobol extension they all have the syntax appropriate syntax highlighting um, now, so that was that was source access um, for source that resides in a PDF. Now let's talk about um, if your source lives in uh, CA Endeavor. So let me just delete this guy uh, for clarity here, and we're going to see the end of there. So I'm, I wrote some scripts here, and I'm going to reference them here. So if I look at the pull script, I will see that first uh, he makes a logs folder because Endeavor, he will um, print out reports of whether or not uh, the pulls and pushes um, were successful and details um, of what, what is happening. Um, so I go into this log folder so that I can keep all my logs organized. And then what he is doing is he is retrieving the list of elements from the sandbox. I can do that here. And then um, for each element in that list, he's retrieving uh, the contents. Um, but first, he's making the appropriate directory. So right, we want a nice structure. Um, so I can follow these commands, make dir dash p up a level. And the type would be like COBOL. And then if I follow this again, I'm going to do type COBOL and stage it is in, which could be one. And again, if I wanted to just pull this, um, this guy, right, he's, the name is Marble 21, the type is COBOL, and the, um, the stage is one. I can replace all, all the appropriate variables in this and do this manually. So bright endeavor retrieve element marble 21 stage number um, one type COBOL to file go up a directory out of logs and then go into COBOL one element name is again marble 21 dot COBOL um, and I can do a no sign out right if I'm just grabbing it and not not pushing any changes I, I don't necessarily need to check that out and he will retrieve that element and put him in um, this folder so we see this structure right um, and, and that shows you how you can pull source out of um, CA Endeavor but you can do something a little bit more powerful than that right you can actually make use of these scripts if you want to pull you know you can pull some subset of element or you could pull you know all the elements so if I ran um, <clears throat> if I ran this script dot slash pull dot sh um, he will go out 
and he will first list the elements and then he's going and grabbing each one. So we see we had a sandbox type uh, element, COBOL type element, LNK type element, and he's just going to pull each one. So starting at marbles, then marble zero zero, um, and then marble zero one, and so on. And that's how you can access source um, in uh, from CA Endeavor remotely. Um, so I've just ended that that process. So now we've shown source access for data sets and source access for CA Endeavor. Now I want to show source access for CA Librarian. So let me switch my project. Open recent librarian demo. And I will be working on uh, CA Librarian, and it's actually um, hosted on a different LPAR. And how we manage connection information easily um, in uh, the Zoe CLI is through profiles. So I can easily switch uh, my profile. So write profiles set ZOSMF. And here the name of my profile is just, uh, I named it ZOSMF. So um, we can do that here. So now my default profile is set. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a series of uh, available batch jobs and then talk about how I use those as a starting place um, to help me pull these uh, data sets locally. So if I do add a uh, profile here, ZOSMS, do search public.testing, just so I can show some additional source here. So um, if I look in this PDS, I got a series of, of batch jobs. And what I did was is I took these batch jobs, which again, I can get syntax highlighting for JCL as well here. And this guy was to do use it um, for a specific element. And what I did is I abstracted these pull and push and list batch jobs. I abstracted away that element. So if we look at like my pull template that I have locally, instead of the element name, I, I implemented some sort of notation here. Um, so what this script, um, will do, let me do the pull. He actually works on a specific element you provide. Um, but before I do that, I might want to see what the list of elements are. So I could do um, bright jobs, submit data set, and do um, oh, from local file here, in, in my case. And I want to do it from JCL, list.jcl. And I would just do uh, view all spool content. So what he's going to do is, he's going to um, submit this job and then um, wait for it to complete and give me back this full content. So this is, this is interesting. Um, I see that, you know, maybe I'm interested in editing this element. Um, but if I had a specific element and this was a large list, um, it might be difficult for me to, to you know, find that. But I can combine um, these commands with common uh, utilities like grep. So I can look for specifically the one I'm interested in, which is COBOL01. And then he would have came back with just the, uh, just the information that I'm looking for here. So again, COBOL01 is the guy I'm interested in, in working with, and he's of type uh, COBOL. Um, so now I'm going to run this uh, script I, I, ran, uh, I created, which basically takes that piece of template JCL, uh, said is just uh, to replace the element with the element I pass into the script, uh, put him in the uh, temp JCL uh, file that I will then um, submit uh, and await for it to complete in this script. And then what he does as a batch job is he takes source out of librarian and puts in a PDS member, and then I'll use uh, the CLI to um, pull that source back in, into my environment. Um, so again, um, let me just run this pull sh. I need to pass the element that I'm looking for, and I actually pass the type here, uh, which isn't necessarily needed, but I like it to download into a structure that um, that I'm familiar with. So it'd be like cobol slash uh, cobol zero one dot cobol. Um, and again, this is a pull from CA librarian. So let me run this guy. Um, so he's creating the, the batch job I want to submit uh, from the template. Then he submits the batch job, awaits for it to complete. When it's complete, I know that my source is in a data set that I then download, and uh, here he is. And so this sort of con 
concludes this initial approach where we wanted to showcase um, remote access of source that resides in either data sets on the mainframe, CA Endeavor on the mainframe, or uh, CA Librarian on the mainframe. So let me give control back to Vaughn, and then we will go Excellent. into our second approach. All right, one moment. You can see my screen? Yep. Okay, okay. so our second approach is going to be how we add Git into the mix and uh, use that to uh, automate concurrent development. So go ahead, Mike. Okay, great. So you may ask why Git, or you may have already be familiar with folks wanting to use Git. Um, Git is a it's a free and open source uh, distributed version control system uh, that generally folks, you know, next next gen developers are already familiar with. It's used to handle everything from small to, to fairly large uh, projects with uh, speed and efficiency. Um, so our bullet points here are: you attract new generation of developers. Um, it's easy to onboard as they already have, um, you know, familiarity with this tool set. Um, support common practices so that other folks in your enterprise using Git, um, if they needed to also work on, on mainframe applications, it would be uh, familiar to them. Um, offers, yes, yeah, similar developer experience across distributed to mainframe. Um, all IDEs have uh, Git integration. Uh, I'll be showing that today in, in the demo. And then you can also leverage popular uh, proven collaboration practices. In my portion of the demonstration, I'll just be showing uh, the Git client. But you can also make use of, uh, in, in the later demonstration that Vaughn will provide, is uh, sort of your enterprise Git or, or GitHub Bitbucket to uh, Endeavor integration, which allows you to do like additional things like review pull requests and uh, you know open issues and things of that nature. Uh, so with that, if you want to uh, pass me control again, and then I will share my screen. Yeah, one second. Okay, you should be presenter now. All right, let me just pick my screen. And we should be good. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep, I can see it. All right, good deal. Okay, so here I've pulled my source locally at, at this point in time. And what I'm going to do is I have Git uh, on my machine. I'm just going to do a Git init to initialize a new Git project. Uh, so he's initialized this, this project. And then uh, if you ever don't know what the status is and you're using the git CLI, you can just do git status. And I see that these files are currently untracked. Well, here, if I'm using git, I probably want to use git to manage the, the source I'm uh, inter interacting with on uh, CA Librarian. Uh, so I can add um, a git ignore file. And in that guy, I'm going to ignore um, some of the utilities that I'm using locally, so this, this JCL folder, um, my pull, and my push scripts, right? So if I save him, and then I do another git status, I'll see that I'm no longer you know, concerned with those guys. I'm actively ignoring them. Um, so here, to add these files, you could do a git add. And I will do a uh, git commit and just call it initial commit. Okay, um, so I'm on just the master branch, and what I'm going to do is I want, as Michelle, uh, to make a change. Um, so I'm going to do git branch and specify my branch, new feature. I do a git checkout uh, of that branch, new feature. Okay, so now I'm, I'm in, in, uh, in the branch, I want to add my change. So I go to my source. I'm just going to change this from test to test, um, I don't know, VS Code user. Okay, I'm going to save that guy, and I'm going to um, commit my change. So if I did a git status here, it's a nice utility. If I want to see what I changed, right, I can do git diff. Um, it's nice. It tells me, tells me what I did. Um, and I can do a git commit. Um, dash a dash m so commit all my changes and I'll just title this Michelle's change 
Okay, great. But maybe I'm working with, you know, Rob and he doesn't want to make use of this environment. He wants to stay um, in the tool set that he's proficient with. So um, here back on the mainframe, um, this is um, a typical interface into CI li CA librarian source known as Ellipse. Um, so I'm going to go in here and I'm going to see that um, COBOL uh, 01 guy. Uh, element. So I'm going to select him and I'm going to make Rob's change or I'll just say mainframe change and I'm going to back out of here. Okay, so Rob has been working on the code on the mainframe and Michelle has been working on the code in um, her IDE of choice and now what I do is Michelle, if I want to merge my changes in, well, first I need to uh, check out the master branch. And what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to rerun that um, pull command to see, you know, sync up with the changes that, you know, my counterpart has made on the mainframe. So um, again, pull.sh and COBOL01 and COBOL. And again, if you notice, when I checked out the new branch, my change is no longer there, right? Um, but when I pull this guy, uh, he should update with Rob's change on, on my master branch. And I see he did. Um, if I was particularly interested in the differences that were, or the changes that were made, I could do a git diff here. And I see the changes that Rob has made. Um, so I can commit these, commit dash A, dash M, and I will call them uh, Rob's changes. And again, I should have a clean status here. Yep. Um, and what I will do now is I will take the changes um, that I made on my new feature branch as Michelle and try to merge them in. So get merge new feature, right? And he will tell me um, that my current change, the one that Rob had made was uh, mainframe change and the one that I'm trying to that I made in my branch was VS code user. So I'm going to accept the incoming change. And now I got to sync him up uh, with uh, the source on the mainframe. So I can use this push script I created, which is fairly similar to the pull script. He modifies a piece of template JCL, puts them in temp JCL, then he uploads um, to uploads the local file to a PDS member on the mainframe, and then he submits the piece of batch JCL um, to uh, transition the code into ellipse, and then he makes sure he completes uh, with condition code zero, um, or else there, there's an issue that we would need to correct. Um, so with that, um, it's as easy as changing uh, the dot push to um, the uh, dot pull to dot push. But first, I'm actually going to um, commit the result now that I uh, made, I, I finished my merge. If I do git commit here, um, he will say unmerge file, so I need to add him git commit dash A. And yep, it was a merge, so that all looks good. Um, Uh, so now that I've merged my branch, again, if I get, get status here, he's going to say he's, on, he's nothing to commit. Um, but now I need to push those changes to the mainframe, so it's as easy as changing. Dot pull to dot push, and he's going to push this change back to uh, ellipse. So we're going to submit a job, wait for it to complete. Oh, it's successful. Okay, so that's what we were looking for. And if I go back into this guy now, I see VS Code user. So uh, Rob can see the changes that I've merged in. So just to uh, quickly recap, uh, we showed how we were able to remotely access um, source from datasets, CA Endeavor, CI Librarian. And once you have any of those um, on your local machine, you can easily use uh, Git to uh, help manage the source. 
Um, so with that, I'll turn it back over to Vaughn. Let me pass the pass control. Thanks. A moment here. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, I can. Okay, so now what I want to talk is about a third approach. So, um, hold on here. So one of the things that Mike showed is how you can use Git uh, locally to take advantage of some of the, um, the, the features around concurrent development and merging and automated merge, uh, and even integrations into the IDE. Uh, so uh, a little bit about what Git is. Git is essentially a tool uh, that was developed for working on the Linux kernel. It allows uh, developers to work with a full uh, copy of their repository on their machine and have full version control uh, access to it. So it keeps a history. Uh, and in addition, they can, they can trade with each other snippets of co source code through pushes and pulls and so on. So it's really a peer-to-peer -peer version control system. But of course, uh, you know, at the enterprise level, you, you can't work uh, in that same way that open source communities work. You wanna have one master version of the code uh, to enable um, you know, people to collaborate and so on. And so that's where uh, enterprise Git repositories come in. So uh, there's a number of them on the market. One of them is by Atlassian called Bitbucket. That's the one I'll be showing. And there's also GitHub and GitLab. There was, those are all popular. But they add enterprise features, like, for instance, being able to have one master that everybody pushes and pulls from. Uh, and of course, uh, they have things like pull requests, code reviews, and, and basically integrations happening at the team level. And so it's very desirable uh, for integrations and, and source code access to um, want to have that kind of integration happening at the enterprise Git level rather than the user level. And it also allows them to have a, a centralized place for the integration to run. So that's what, uh, what the next approach we're going to show you. We're going to actually show you an integration that um, is specifically built for Endeavor that allows you to plug into your enterprise Git repository and use it to um, push and pull changes to Endeavor SCM. So you might also ask yourself, well, if I've got that, um, why, is S why is Endeavor in the mix? And of course, Git is the version control piece. Endeavor has far more than version control. Uh, in addition to having the version control and the history there that you've had for many, many, many years, you've also got lifecycle automation. And that takes the form of all of your builds, all of your deployment automation, even your test automation, and of course, if uh, you know if you if you didn't have Endeavor in the mix, you'd have to reinvent all of that. Yes, you could use Git, but you would have to completely reinvent all of the lifecycle automation. So we think the best of both worlds is to keep Endeavor using the lifecycle automation, but to allow Git to be the front end. And so you end up with something like this, right? So you have Endeavor over here in the top right with its lifecycle automation, uh, all of the master code all of the build, the binaries, all of the, all of the things that happen to you know, move the code through a life cycle, front-ended by an integration at the enterprise Git repository level. So for instance, you can uh, have developers working in their IDE, which of course is pinned to their local Git, and when they push, it can automatically go into Endeavor. And of course, you may still need to do things like builds and packaging and promotes in Endeavor as well, and of course, that's not really something that Git does. And so for that, you have something like Zoe or Brightside CLI to uh, basically automate the things that happen in Endeavor. And, and those are going to be topics that are part of our uh, ongoing series. So we'll leave those for now. All right. So I'm going to do a demonstration. Let me just switch out to my VM. One sec. And let's see if I can figure out how to switch the... Okay. Hold on. Looking for the presenter view. Can you guys see that? Um, no. The approach three demonstration. <clears throat> Hold on, it keeps switching to the here. Hold on, a sec here. Uh, let's try that. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes, we can see uh, VS Code. Yep. Okay. Perfect. All right, so what I've got here is Visual Studio Code. You should be familiar with this from uh, Mike's demo. And I've got uh, a local workspace checked out. 
and I've actually checked it out from my Bitbucket repository. So over here, you can see I've got a Bitbucket repository and it has a number of different branches in it. And one of the branches is actually synchronized to Endeavor. And you can actually control that uh, as the repository owner um, through the plugin, you get an Endeavor configuration page. And if I come in here and look at that, you can see that it's essentially pointing at our Endeavor web services and an entry stage for a specific system and subsystem. And likewise, I can show you over here that I have a profile and that on my profile page, I have a spot where I can maintain my mainframe credentials. And that's important because as I do work in the um, Bitbucket repository, anything that propagates to Endeavor, I want to have happen as me, not as some other user uh, or a service account or something like that to maintain my traceability in Endeavor. So, uh, so I've got that repository initialized, and if we look inside, you can see I've got a bunch of different code in here, organized by type, and uh, I can I can look at it and see that's just plain old COBOL code and so on. So, uh, in any case, um, I've got uh, over here the same code um, checked out, and I'm going to go through a little use case that just shows, you know, how a, uh, a developer would typically work with uh, with this with this um, code and and you know, integrate all of the changes that they're making. Another thing that's pretty cool about this is that um, I can actually work with developers who are making changes on the mainframe. And uh, so if I want to use Git, but somebody else doesn't want to use Git, uh, they want to, you know, they're happy in their 3270 environment, they can continue to work there and we can collaborate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by um, basically, let me exit out of here. I'm going to do a uh, pull onto my repo and make sure that I have the latest code from all of the different developers. So I've gone ahead and done a git pull. And uh, I don't know if you saw that, but there was a little progress bar going there. And now I'm going to uh, do what developers typically do, which is create a feature branch. So I'm going to go ahead in here and I'm going to do a checkout to and uh, I'm going to pick uh, create new branch from. So I'll give it the branch name. Let's say I'm going to associate it with my user story. So we'll call it user story uh, one, two, three. I'll hit enter and I'll pick which branch I want to go off of. So I'm going to go off of this branch and it's created a new branch for me. And so now I'm working on a feature branch isolated from my other developers. So I'm going to go in here and let's say I wanted to come in here to my Marvel's one code, open that up, and I'm going to make a change just in the comments uh, here to uh, reflect the things that uh, that I'm doing. So I'll say this is a change from Michelle, oops, which if you recall is our uh, newer developer that um, you know prefers to use modern tools. And at the same time that I'm that I'm doing this, I'm going to show what happens uh, if somebody prefers to work on the green screen. So I'm going to come in here, and uh, I've got my my green screen code, and I'm going to uh, come in and make an edit, All right? So I'm I'm the other user. I'm playing the role of Rob, which I'm not sure if we mentioned is our persona for the seasoned mainframer. So I'm going to go in, uh, make the same change at the same time. There we go. And this time I'll say this is by Rob, right? So I'll say change code and uh, I'll exit out. And so what's happening uh, is obviously this is that was through quick edit. So it's going through and it's doing its build. And now, uh, of course, Michelle doesn't necessarily know what Rob's up to. So she's going to just go through and do the work that she would normally do. So one of the things I may want to do as developer is actually build this code without necessarily checking it in. So part of this integration that uh, we include is a script that allows you to do just that. So I'm going to actually run that and show how that works. So you'll notice that I've got my marbles code. Uh, changed. It's showing as modified over here, um, and I haven't actually done anything. I haven't even committed it to Git. Uh, and from here, I can go into my uh, my my root folder, and I can use the script that we provide with the Git Endeavor integration to facilitate local builds. So let's go ahead and do that. And you can see over here that it is essentially preparing the environment. Now, what it's doing is it's actually using um, my my remote source or origin to see exactly what I've changed, and it's uploading it into a developer build area, a private build area that is concatenated with uh, all the changes up the map, and it's uh, doing a compilation. There we go. So it's essentially using Endeavor as a build service, even though I haven't necessarily checked any any source code in. And you can see that my build was successful. Let's say I wanted to look at the listing. I could go ahead in here and do uh, a get to fetch that. 
So we'll do marbles one, COBOL, whoops. And now it's going out and it's fetching from Endeavor the listings for that, that build that I did. So I can see all of the results of the build and so on. In fact, it's actually building all of the all of those details into log files in my work in, work area over here. But I can actually just uh, hold down control and click this. Let me minimize that. And you can see that it's gone and fetched the code out here. And I can see that it's actually got uh, my, by, my from Michelle change, right? So it was built with that exact change that I made without even committing it. So uh, from there, I could take it out of my developer build area, test it and so on. But basically, once I'm, um, once I'm ready with this, I can go ahead and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and commit this. So I'm going to come in here. I'm going to commit my change. And uh, well, and of course, if I double click over here, you can see it's showing me what my changes are. So we'll give it a, uh, a, a message. We'll say, uh, by Michelle as my commit message. We'll go ahead and do the commit. And I'll switch back to my master and see if there's anything else happening from other developers. So I'm gonna come over here. I'm gonna check back out to the uh, master branch. So we'll switch it. Okay, and now you can see that there's no differences. And of course, in the meantime, we had that change that was being done by, by Rob over here, right? So out on the mainframe, the change that I'm working on is actually uh, older, right? So here's, here's the by Rob change. So if I come back and look and see what's happening in our enterprise Git repo, let's back out a little here. We'll see that you have this automatic Endeavor synchronization change. And if I look in, we'll see that Rob's change has actually propagated backwards into, uh, in, into the, the uh, enterprise Git repository. So it's a two-way bidirectional synchronization. Now what that enables me to do is I can go back into my uh, my my folder where I've got my get changes and I can do a pull. So I'm essentially taking Rob's changes from the mainframe and pulling them into my local Git repository. And so if we go over here, we'll see there's Rob's changes, right, in marbles. And now what I can do is I can go in here and I can uh, actually merge my uh, other branch, right? So I can come in here and uh, I can do a git merge. So let me exit out of the build script environment. I'll do a git merge user story one, two, three. And uh, oh, so not something we can merge. Okay. Why is that? What did I do wrong? Give me a moment here. Let's see here. Oh, that's why, because I typed the name of the user, the branch wrong. <laughs> All right, so let's try that again. I'll put my underscore in this time. And, uh, oh, did I just switch to that branch? Give me a moment. Give me a moment here. Yeah, I switched to that branch accidentally when we were doing that. So let's try this one last time. Okay, so I'm going to do a checkout. I'm going back to my master. And uh, this time I'm going to do a, well, I'll just do it up there. There we go. So it actually merged it. And uh, very much like before, it found a merge conflict. So we can come in here and you can see that it's showing me in the merge editor. I can see the change from Rob. I can see the change from Michelle. And in fact, I could accept both changes, compare changes. I'm going to actually take the incoming change from Michelle uh, and override that. So we'll go ahead and take that from Michelle change. And now it's showing... Uh, up as a merge change. So I'm going to go ahead and stage that. Oh, sorry. Hold on here. Save it. And we should see. Bear with me a moment. Uh, let's see. I think I accidentally did the wrong thing. So what we're going to do is actually do a merge right now. Another way of doing this. Hold on one second. I'm doing this wrong here. Yeah, I shouldn't have said that there. Okay, well, in any case, I'm going to stage these and see what happens. So we'll go ahead. Oh, here we go. That's what I'm after. There we go. Right. So let's do a modified. So we've got these guys in here. It's showing the change from Michelle is the new one. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and commit this. We'll say from Michelle. So we'll 
go ahead and commit the change. And now, of course, this is actually just showing me all these changes locally. And in fact, if I look at the uh, merge graph, we can see all the different things. So over here, we had the synchronization come in, we did the merge, and then finally, we went on this version, uh, which is from Michelle, um, showing the uh, th that piece over there. And uh, now what I wanna do is actually, so I've got this locally, I wanna send this actually to the um, to the to the to the shared team repo. So what I'm going to do here is do a push, and if we go and look at the team repo over here, let's go back to the source, come in here to the COBOL files, and we over here see the by Michelle change. Right, there's the from Michelle change that I merged in, and uh, I'm going to expect this to go to the to the mainframe. And of course, we could do uh, you know Rob's change as well in there. But over here, there's the change, and you can see that it's propagated to the mainframe seamlessly. So in this sense, uh, you can collaborate with users working on the mainframe. And of course, I could have done a pull request as well. So that's it for uh, my demo portion. Let me go back to the uh, deck. And uh, give me a moment. Here we go. So just uh, a wrap up. Um, so essentially, there's a there's there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can work with. Uh, whoops back a whole bunch of different ways we can work with SCMs but really the common denominator here is that we're taking an integration based approach we're not saying hey you got to throw out everything uh, and adopt newer sexier tools that are just going to be another niche mainframe tool that keeps mainframe in its silo so some people may be saying hey you just need a more modern tool specially designed for mainframe I don't think that's the right approach uh, others are saying hey you should throw everything away and adopt standards and of course if we looked at the the, um, list of tools that are out there, the popular tools, those would pretty much be Git. Um, so you can just, hey, adopt Git on the mainframe. We think an integration-based based approach is a lot more um, sensible from a business decision. You don't have to do a conversion. There's no unnecessary cost or risks. It sits on top of your uh, investment in processes and automation, uh, transforms them into a service, so you have a, a better interface if, if the developers wish to do that. And for those that don't, for those that are quite happy in their 3270 environment, they stay there. So this, to me, makes the most sense out of all the different options out there uh, in terms of in, you know, integrating or modernizing your SCM. Uh, for that next generation of developers. So uh, just a little plug, we have our next webinar coming up on May 8th. We'll be covering automated mainframe testing. And uh, if you wanna learn more, um, obviously we've seen some of the um, scripting that uh, Mike was doing with Brightside, which is again, based on the, the Zoe CLI. Um, if you go to ca.com slash Brightside, you can find uh, you know, the downloads, uh, sample code, white papers, the webinar recordings. And of course, if you go to ca.com slash Endeavor, you'll find information about our uh, Enterprise Git repository integration, which is part of uh, an option called the CA Endeavor SCM integrations for enterprise DevOps. And there's a data sheet there. And of course, if anybody wants to see a demo in their shop, they can contact us as well. So uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, I'll stop. Thanks, Vaughn, and thanks, Mike. Uh, actually, we, we are out of <laughs> we are out of time, so thank you to everyone. Um, if, you, if you do have any questions, uh, I would encourage you to again fill out the survey that's going to pop up at the when when we close this down. There's a field in there for asking questions. Please feel free to use that, and I will make sure that um, that, that Vaughn and Mike get that, and they'll get back to you as soon as they can. And again, um, thank you for your time today, and we hope you'll join us uh, next month for the next session in the series. So have a great day, everybody. Thanks, everyone.